But this morning, we're continuing our, our journey through Luke. If you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we heard about the, the cost of following Jesus and, and how it's a, it's a very high cost um, that is required of us in multiple different ways. And then last week, we um, looked at Jesus sending out the 72 or preparing to send out the, the 72 and, and talked about that when, when, when he did that, you know, he was sending them out to prepare uh, the people that he was sending them to for, for his arrival because he was going to go to all these different places. And that, in turn, for us today, um, we are just like those 72 where, uh, you know, Jesus is coming again. And he's sending us out into the world to prepare it for his return. And that leads us to, to where we find ourselves today in verse 2. But I'm still going to, like I said last week, I'm still going to read uh, verses 1 through 12 of, of Luke chapter 10. And so, as is our custom, I invite you to stand if you are able. Father, I pray that you'd pour out your spirit upon us and upon your word. May you open our hearts minds and ears to receiving it, and may we take it and apply it to our lives. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. Hear these words from the book that we love. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Please be seated. All right. Every year during early to mid-fall, which is basically now, <laughs> um, it's the time of the year that, that we most commonly associate with the harvesting of crops, and there's good reasons for that. Now, depending on what type of crop it is, there can be some fluctuation as to when the actual harvest takes place, because there's some crops where it's early in the season, and there's some that are later in the season. But putting all that aside, like I said, there's a lot of different reasons why people associate early to mid-fall with a harvest because of what's going on around them, especially in nature. This time of year is when you, if you go someplace where there's a, a lot of trees, and I've noticed that, yes, this even happens in the desert to a certain extent, but maybe more so if you're from um, northeast Ohio like I am. Either way, if you, if you drive down a road or through a park and there's a lot of trees, this would be the time of the year where um, you're just assaulted by a, a tapestry of, of brilliant and vivid colors. So you'll see a lot of reds and yellows and, 
and oranges as the leaves are preparing to fall and, uh, and, and you see them. And there are even people in, in, in bus tours and trips that will market specifically for this very thing where people will load up in, in the buses just to go see the, uh, the, the colors of the leaves. And it's, and it's beautiful. It really is. And it can be um, uh, just uh, an assault on, on, on your senses, really, and overwhelming at times to try to take in all of this color. And then there's also then the decorations that people will put up outside their houses. Not everyone is obsessed with Halloween, but they still like to de- decorate for the season. And so you'll see a lot of decorations in colors that are intended to mimic this wide array of color that we can see in the leaves. I think part of it is, is that in most places other than the desert, this is the time of the year where it starts cooling down, and so there's a warmth that comes to those colors, and so people are trying to hang on to that warmth for as long as they can before it gets bitterly cold. <laughs> so, so you have that aspect to it. But then there's also the element of, of farming. This is, again, the time of the year where, where the harvest comes in, and so for them it means a lot of work. Many farmers will work from the time before the sun comes up to even after it's set in order to get the harvest in on time. So all that food that we give thanks for a month from now is there because somebody put a lot of time and work into uh, getting it to that point. So there's that. Or then there's other people like me where I wasn't a farmer, but uh, where my mom lives, the house that I grew up in, in that yard, there were lots and lots of trees. I want to say at least a dozen, maybe more. And these weren't little trees. They were all very big trees with lots of branches and lots of leaves. And it was up to my brothers and I to rake those leaves every fall. And when all was said and done, we probably bagged Oh, probably about a couple hundred leaves every year. It was a lot of work, and it took a long time. But it didn't take nearly as much time as it takes for the farmers to bring in the harvest. Although, much like farmers, there were times where we wished we had more help, more labor to to cover more ground and to speed things up, um, because the leaves were certainly plentiful. So now where does all of this lead me? What does it have to do with what Jesus says here in Luke chapter 10, verse 2? And I think it leads us to this. And that is, just as there is in farming or in raking leaves, there is an abundance of lost, hurting, and lonely people out there in the world today whose souls are fertile for the planting of the gospel and are just waiting to be harvested. To use the word that Jesus used, they are indeed plentiful. The only problem is with that, though, is that sometimes there just aren't enough laborers to bring in the harvest. When faced with that kind of a situation, we as Christians and as a church need to, as Jesus says, to pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest, his harvest, in order to be fruitful and successful. What that means is that we can't do it on our own. We need the help, number one. We need the help and the strength of the Lord of the harvest to do that. But we also need the help of our brothers and sisters in Christ, whom God has surrounded us with. We must pray and ask God to send us those people who will labor alongside of us in doing the work of the ministry just as he has told us to do it. In many respects, it is a, yet another example of the call given to God by us in order to be obedient to the commands that he has given us to take his, world, his word into the world and to make disciples. Now when you get right down to it, that's really what this is all about. It's about obedience to the word. Now when it comes to this verse, there are 
a couple of different ways I think you can think about it. And one of them is this. You can take it literally, meaning you can take it word for word. You can read what it says, and you can do exactly what Jesus is telling us to do here. He is telling us to pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is, if you will, a direct order or a command from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to pray for something that is so very important for any church or ministry to have if it is going to be fruitful and successful in proclaiming the gospel to the world around it. Amen. Just as a business would not be successful if it did not have the laborers it needed in order to uh, sustain itself, the church is a lot the same way. If there aren't enough laborers within the church to bring in the harvest, then it's just not going to last very long. It might hang on for a little while, but at the end of the day, if there's just not enough laborers, eventually that, that church, that body, will wither up and it will die. And Jesus knew that. He knew that if the world was going to know about him, if the world was going to know and to hear his word, that he was going to need people who would labor for him in spreading that word across the entire world. And this is why he tells us to pray for it. This is why he tells us to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send the laborers needed in order to accomplish those things, to accomplish those things that he has called us and his church to do. And he doesn't just tell us to pray, but rather he says to pray earnestly. Webster's Dictionary defines the word earnest like this. A serious and intent mental state, characterized or proceeding from an intense and serious state of mind. A serious and intent mental, mental state characterized by or proceeding from an intense and serious state of mind. Pray earnestly. Pray with a serious and intent state of mind. It seems as if it takes on a little more weight or meaning if you think about it in those terms. Now what this means is that when Jesus tells us to pray to the Lord of the harvest, he doesn't want us to pray one of those half-hearted, ho-hum kind of, well, yeah, I'm praying because my pastor told me that I should pray, so Jesus, could you help us out and just send us some folks, you know? Right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> because we do that. I mean, don't we? You know, it, it, again, it's like that, you know, we call it that, that Sunday school answer. You know, you ask, you ask a question, you don't know the answer until, you know, like Jesus and God and stuff. You know, figuring that you'll catch one of them, you know, or like taking the fill in the blank test, you know, C, 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 C. Well, if you fill in enough C's, eventually you get at least 75% or so they say. So he's, that's, what he, that's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about this, this, this lax day. He's like, okay, I'm just kind of going through the motions of what I think is expected of me. That's, that's not what's going on here. Because prayers like that, quite frankly, are, are just kind of generic. And they have no real form or substance to them. And I'd stop short of saying that, that God doesn't hear them, because certainly he does. But at the same time... If that's what we're doing, we're missing the mark then to which he wants us to get here. Rather, what he's talking about and what he wants for us, what he wants us to do when we pray for laborers is he wants, to, wants us to do it with a, an intent and focused state of mind. 
He wants us to pray and to pray hard. He wants us to pray earnestly. He wants us to pray with such passion and desire that nothing is going to get in our way. He wants our prayers to be focused and he wants them to be purposeful. He wants us to do this and to take his words, his commands, seriously. He wants us to pray like we mean it. And that we believe in him not only because he has told us to do that, but he wants us to pray because we believe that he indeed will do exactly what it is that we are asking him to do. Amen. <laughs> Amen. He wants us to be serious and he wants us to be intense when we pray for laborers to be sent. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now that's one thing. That's one way you can look at it. But one thing that's important to remember in all of this, in thinking about all this, is especially in this verse, is also context. We're not going to proof text here where we cherry pick you know, our favorite verses and be like, eh, 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 eh. we need to consider what else is going on around the verse. And so with what it has, in this verse, it happens in the context of Jesus appointing the 72 people who are going to be sent out two by two into every town and place that he himself was about to go. They were being sent out in order to do something incredibly difficult and draining. And that fact alone would require some focused and intense prayer in order to prepare them for the task that was waiting for them. There's also then the reality that they wouldn't be able to do it on their own. They were going to need some help, and that's why they were being sent out two by two. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow servant. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. How important, how important is earnest, intense, and focused prayer in preparing people for the work that lies ahead? It's important enough that one dark night in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, who was less than a day away from the cross, prayed so intensely that blood poured from his pores as if it were sweat as he prepared himself for the work that he was about to do. So that's one way to look at that and think about it. When Jesus has told us to pray for laborers to be sent into the harvest field. And then another way is this. And I'm going to tell you a little story. Not my story, but a story shared by Billy Graham. Now, if you remember from my testimony a few months back, it was at a Billy Graham crusade in Cleveland, Ohio in 1994 that I first felt the Lord tugging on my heart and, and calling me to ministry. I wanted to be able to talk to people about Billy, or about Jesus like Billy did, but I'm talking about him now, so, you know, we've got, <laughs> we've got those, both those covered. <laughs> In his autobiography, Just As I Am, Billy talks about growing up in Charlotte, North Carolina in the late 20s through the, and throughout the 1930s. It was also a time when all kinds of people, businessmen and evangelists, were crisscrossing the country, either selling things or preaching the gospel, and sometimes they were doing both. Now, they would frequently travel in the South because people seemed to be more receptive down there. And so because of that, North Carolina saw its fair share of travelers. At one point, a traveling Methodist evangelist had called Billy's father up to the front of one of these meetings. And it was during that time that this, this evangelist had, had said to, to Billy's father that here is a man whom God has called preach. 
in reference to Billy's father. Now, shortly after this happened, the Graham family went through some very trying times because of a, a near fatal and very horrific accident that, uh, that his father was in. He nearly died. But after much prayer, his father fully recovered from this accident. And it was out of that experience that Billy then writes the following. I have no doubt it was partly that experience that prompted Father to support the Christian businessmen in Charlotte who wanted to hold one of their all-day prayer meetings in our pasture in May 1934. The group had held three similar meetings since they started praying together 18 months earlier. My mother invited the ladies to the farmhouse for their own prayer meeting. That afternoon when I came back from school and went to pitch hay in the barn across the road with one of our hired hands, we heard singing. Who are those men over in the woods making all that noise, he asked me. I guess they're some fanatics that have talked daddy into using the place, I replied. Years later, my father recalled a prayer that a man named Vernon Patterson had prayed that day that out of Charlotte the Lord would raise up someone to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. At that time in 1934, it certainly wasn't obvious that that someone might be me. My father knew that I went along with the family to church every week, only grudgingly or of necessity to use a biblical phrase. I believe he sincerely wanted me to experience what he had felt a quarter century earlier, in fact, he privately hoped and prayed that his firstborn son might someday fulfill the old Methodist evangelist prophecy by becoming a preacher in his stead. The reason I share this story is to make this point, and that is this, and that have you ever considered that while in this verse, yes, Jesus is calling us to pray for laborers to be sent into the harvest, have you ever considered that it may in fact be you that he is calling to be one of those laborers? Like I said, yes, Jesus has called us to pray for laborers to be sent into the harvest. But at the same time, it is also us that he is calling to be those laborers that either we or somebody else have prayed for. Look at Billy Graham. At a prayer meeting on his father's farm in 1934, someone prayed that God would raise up from out of Charlotte, North Carolina, someone who would preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. In addition to that, even Billy's own father had prayed that that someone would be his own son. Imagine, if you will, for a moment, if Vernon Patterson had not prayed that prayer. And imagine if Billy's father had not prayed as he did. Had those things not happened, it's possible that we may have never heard of this man named Billy Graham. And we might not have been hearing about the ministry that we just saw here this morning. Because his son, Franklin Graham, is the one who started that. So think about that. Consider that it could very well be you and not someone else that the Lord is calling to be one of his laborers. <laughs> I used to not think that about myself for a very long time, <laughs> but I have now come to believe that the ways in which the Holy Spirit has moved and worked in my life and in the life that he has called me to, that they, those things are a direct result of someone's, probably many someone, many people, and their prayer that God would send laborers into his harvest. And some of those people, I'm sure of it, may have been you, even though you may have not known my name until now. 
I am sure of it just as I am sure that someone somewhere, whether they be from right here in this place right now, or in some place else half a world away, I am sure that someone is praying at this moment for God to send the laborers into the harvest and that listed among those laborers is your name. <laughs> because we don't just get to come here on a Sunday morning and hear a good message and leave and feel good about ourselves. <laughs> There's more to it than just that. Why don't we have enough laborers? I think it's because of that very thing. We've got far too many churches and far too many people who will just come on a Sunday and then leave. He has called you. Jesus has called us to pray. And he has called us to pray earnestly. He has called us to pray intently and focused prayers for laborers to be sent into his harvest. And we need to remember that, that it's his, it's not ours. We're not going out there so that we can come here on Sunday and feel good again because the seats are full. No, it's all for him. It's his harvest. He has called us also to be those laborers. So as we pray, we also need to remember that. So I challenge you today. I challenge you to come and join me on this journey. I call you and challenge you to walk the road together and alongside your brothers and sisters as we go out into the world into an abundant harvest field that lies waiting to be harvested outside the walls of this building. And in doing so, bringing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ into a world that needs it. The good news of a saving grace that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of a harvest that he would send out laborers into his harvest. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Let's pray.